us join the band as we all head for the refreshments down. Start record. Let's say hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Concession Stand. We're here. We're back. Revival. It's revival. Uh, well, it was more like, uh, so the original plan, as everyone remembers, is that, uh, it was going to be Yankee Doodle Dandy, uh, and then some stuff happened where it was revealed, like, actually, if I tried to give Yankee Doodle Dandy to Zen the way we usually share movies together, there's a good chance that I might get hit by a bill, because this internet's real good. It's like the Terminator. <laughs> That's just it's impressive how bad it is. It's impressive how bad it is. Someone not of my family, because we know how to find stuff, was recently got charged extra for taking a copy of the Nutcracker in the Four Suites in the Four Realms. So now that I know that that's a possibility, we're gonna have to be a little bit more cautious. So we're gonna be going for movies that are a little bit easier for us to get to until the day comes. It's another. It's another situation where a podcast we do together is hamstrung by the fact that it is not in a <laughs> house that i own yeah one of these days you'll get a, a home yes one of these days that will happen and we will finally watch uh Yankee doodle dandy which will be great but for right now we'll talk about the movie we watched today which is let me get the full title because i literally forgot Yu-Gi-Oh: the dark side of dimensions which i thought it was the dark dimension but it's not is the dark side of dimensions side of dimensions the dark side of dimensions yep and it is the most recent Yu-Gi-Oh movie that takes place after Very recent, by the way 2016 yeah it takes place storyline wise after the events of Yu-Gi-Oh so if you have not read or watched Yu-Gi-Oh get ready for some spoilers of Yu-Gi-Oh as we get into it so let me give a quick uh, quick plot summary uh, so it begins up, uh, the Kaiba Corp, it actually begins in, like, what feels like the universe is being destroyed, but it actually turns out it's just Kaiba Corp is doing some shit. Uh, it's just Kaiba being fucking Kaiba. Kaiba's doing Kaiba stuff, and then a, um... Okay, so I'm trying to remember, okay, so it starts with all the Kaiba, it doesn't start with the Kaiba duel, right? Kaiba duel, it, uh, yeah, it does. Okay, so it does begin with Kaiba dueling uh, Atem, the pharaoh, who at this point is not a part of Yugi's body anymore. He's moved on. He's literally passed on. It's, it's, this is after the ceremonial duel, so he is not in the Millennium Puzzle anymore. He is in the afterlife. Yes. So they duel each other. Uh, there's a bunch of, you know, it's exactly what you expect. There's blue eyes. The dark magician shows up. Uh, another blue eyes shows up. And then... A, the only thing that's different is that it ends with Kaiba winning. Yeah, we should also point out they have modernized decks. Yes. So Kaiba is using like crazy synchro blue eyes monsters that are like certain updates to the blue eyes and the dark magician are used in this. Yes. Uh, funny enough, the only one with updated decks is them. It seems Joey is literally running the exact same cards that he always has. Because at one point they show. Did he even get a proper duel? I think I thought wasn't he just like comic relief in this pretty much? Yeah, he get. There's a cameo by the Red Eyes who they didn't even give him like an updated Red Eyes. There's literally thousands of Red Eyes. It's just the Red Eyes. <laughs> Like, the same old art in anything. Anyway, so they duel, Kaiba wins, and this is where you learn that Kaiba has basically created a machine that will make the person's imagination a reality? I think that's, like, the base. So, he spent millions of dollars on a duel disc that will literally turn fantasy into reality, and he's also spent, which I'm going to assume is millions of dollars trying to recreate the pharaoh. And he makes at one point that the hardest part about making the pharaoh was his hair, which was extremely difficult and cost the most money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he says, it's not enough. It's I'm dueling. Basically, it's not the real thing. I need to duel the real thing. Otherwise, it doesn't count. Even if I win, then he crushes a bottle and he says, fire the person who made that bottle. Uh, he he said that uh, Kaiba Corporation products should not break that easily. Yeah, they <laughs> should fire whoever designed that bottle. <laughs> Yeah, so it seems like uh, Kaiba is also digging under. He's he's found the Millennium item, the the um the puzzle. He's found the puzzle, thought lost after the duel uh between Yugi and Natem, but he's basically found it, and they're gonna go find it, and they're gonna go get it. 
But then at this point, then they go cuts to Yugi, who's at his final year at Domino, and they're just doing like kid shit. Uh, Yugi looks slightly older. He's tall now, which is weird. He's tall. He's still not that tall, but he's taller. Yeah, in terms of the differences, uh, Joey looks exactly the same. Tristan looks exactly the same. I want to say Taya looks slightly bigger in some places. And is more, even more anime. Yeah, even more <laughs> so, anime. You know, use your imagination as to what that implies. Yeah. Uh, Yuki is slightly taller, and Mokuba's uh, rocking a more like. You could, if it wasn't for his voice, it would be very hard to tell if it was a very up and coming girl or a very proper young boy. <laughs> in terms of the look and designs. Uh, so yeah, he's hanging out. I don't. Would you say that Yugi is as tall as the Pharaoh was in this one? N- right? I, I think they do a side by side, and the Pharaoh is still slightly taller. Okay. But he's pretty close. He's getting up to the point where I assume it's the beginning of Yu Gi Oh GX, where he's eventually going to just look like the Pharaoh, right? He literally just pretty much looks like the pharaoh, yeah. Yeah. Just without the hair standing up. Exactly. Uh, so, at this point, they introduce this young kid, who I forget the name of. I want to say it's uh, it's Diva, but then his name is like... Uh, is, the, is the villain, yeah. Is the villain. For all intents and purposes, he has two names. We're going to call him Diva. They're like, I remember that guy, but I also don't remember that guy. I also does the exact same thing that uh, Merrick does, where he makes a fake name so that he can be their friend. Yes. And here's another good cameo, because uh, this is basically based off of Yu-Gi-Oh! I guess the best way of de- differentiating it is Duelist, which is there's no pre-time back when Yu-Gi was uh, straight up Merkin Fools with Shadow Games. Well, fun fact is uh, Duelist actually does consider that to be canon. Yeah, it is, all that stuff does happen. It's just that it's never really brought up. But the one... Well, four Kids doesn't. That There's your big difference. Okay. Is that this is based off purely the anime, which that shit doesn't happen. And that's why it's quote-unquote season zero. Yeah. It's the magical forbidden season. But there is one character from there that does make an appearance, and that is the gym teacher. The gym teacher who, if people remember, he's the one who gets turned into a pawn by Bakura. That's the when you know Bakura's kind of fucking evil. If you remember the final arc of the pre Yu Gi Oh duelist thing, it's him. So he's in this movie. Uh, he doesn't really do much. I just like the fact that he's in it. I thought that was a really nice touch <laughs> on their part. So anyway, Sedeko's to get the Millennium Puzzle from the chamber, and then that's when a mis- that's when Diva shows up and reveals to be like, okay, not before then. Diva gets bullied on by a bunch of kids. I remember that part. He gets bullied by a bunch of kids. And the most thing I remember about the bullies is that one of the bullies looks like he's half head. One of the bullies looks like he's mostly head and the rest of him is body. (laughs) (laughs) It's real fucked up. Anyway, he ends up like straight up, I think, disintegrating the bullies. That's how you know he's evil. Uh, They go to Seto goes to get the Millennium Puzzle, but then he shows up and he's like, I'm D.Va and I have powers that got to me from my master. And I want to say at this point, they reveal that the master is Scotty, whoever everyone's favorite, the guy who had the Millennium Onk for uh, the most a very long period of time. Shoddy. Shoddy. Yes. Yeah. They call him master uh, whatever. That's why I keep thinking of it. But yeah, it's Shoddy. Very important character that totally is really relevant in Yu-Gi-Oh prior to this. Yeah, sort of. We'll get into that a little bit later. <laughs> anyway, him and Kaiba do a duel, and then this is the one of the first parts where they go like, this duel is going to be a, a dimension duel, which the dimension duel means that the amount of attack your monster and defense has is dependent on how much spirit you give them. This is never a thing. This never gets brought up. It really no. just feels like an excuse to make it feel like these characters are hurting when they're summoning. But both Kaiba and will- you the shadow games anymore so they need some bullshit to give a reason why the characters are going ah er, when they're getting hurt yeah so he's dueling kaiba and he's being the most shittiest duelist because he's just making all his monsters attack zero when he has all bunch of dragons and kaiba's about to lose and this is where i think it's first revealed that the technology kaiba has made i feel is specifically made to make him not lose to anyone but the pharaoh because he summons, ex- uh, not Exodia, he summons Obelisk out of nowhere. Yeah. He slams the ground. He literally, he punches the ground because technically that's where the god cards are. They fell underneath along with the Millennium items, didn't they? Yes. They did. They say it, they disappeared when the Pharaoh disappeared. He literally punches the ground and pulls Obelisk the Tormentor out of it. 
Yeah. So then uh he says, You can't do th- you can't summon a monster that way, and then he says, He's Novelisk isn't a monster, he's a god. So he literally just says, Yes, I cheated, but it's okay. Yeah. And so he basically wins this game. I wanna say he wins it, but in a way that the duel is not finished. He still has one more turn. But it doesn't matter. They finish as excavating the Millennium Item. So Mokuba literally like jumps on top of it and then with a helicopter is about to fly it out. Uh Diva shows up and punches through it with his like magic shadow hand and he takes two parts of it and he gives it to his sister. This is basically Diva's deal. I will now explain it, is that basically he was trained by Scotty. Something happened to Scotty. He basically got uh Killed. Can't help but think that you're saying Scotty, like the engineer from the Starship Enterprise. Oh, Scotty. Uh, uh, yes, this is Scotty, the Yu-Gi-Oh overarching villain, Scotty. <laughs> Scotty in the engine room. All right, this is uh, how do you say his name then? Scotty, because it's an H, not a K. Scotty, Scotty, Shoddy, Shoddy. Oh, it's Shoddy. I'm saying it completely wrong. My yeah, bad, Shoddy. His master was Shadi, and when Bakura got the Millennium Ring, he killed Shadi. Which there's a lot of like questionable things about that doesn't make sense about how Shadi is able to still appear. But anyway, uh, Shot kind of fucking like he's like a spirit of the Millennium items. I guess, I guess so. Anyway, we'll, again, we'll talk about more of that later because it really is something. So that's when Bakura becomes uh possessed with the Millennium Ring and he fucking kills Shadi. And also Shadi was apparently just running an orphanage of kids and the kids are in a basically what is a cult, which says after the Pharaoh disappears, they get the ability to make a perfect world. But if the Pharaoh ever returns, they lose the power. And so he wants revenge on his friends because Bakura, when he turned evil because he was possessed by uh, Thief Bakura, or whatever is the evil entity inside of the ring, he killed a bunch of his... uh, He killed Scotty, and then I believe he killed some of his friends as well. Uh, And that's why he's doing what he's doing. So he takes some of the puzzles specifically because he doesn't want to bring back the Pharaoh. Kaiba wants to bring back the Pharaoh because he's the only person he he doesn't feel like dueling if and doesn't feel like he can lose to anyone but him. And Yugi at this point is just being a teenager trying to live his life. Uh so when Yugi is living his life, uh Kaiba shows up in the Domino City terminal, which makes it seem like uh, Kaiba just runs this entire city now. And he announces, We're gonna I'm gonna have a new dual disc, get your fucking money ready. I'm going to reveal it soon. Uh, Yugi wants to be friends with Diva. Diva does some shit when Bakura and Joey are next to each other. He tries to erase Joey's memory, and he tries to basically, like, say, Bakura, I'm going to kill you because you're a murdering piece of shit. Bakura cries because he goes, like, because this is good boy Bakura, and he's like, I'm very sorry about what happened. I also lost someone. And Diva's like, this is kind of fucked up. I feel like I'm punishing the wrong guy. (laughs) But it it doesn't matter because, uh, but Diva's friend who is also a part of his cult, finds that the Millennium Ring was not destroyed, because apparently when the landslide happened, the only thing that happened is that everything got buried. The items are all still 100% okay. <laughs> so he takes the ring, and now the ring is like doing some evil shit with Diva. It's messing with his mind, and Bakura gets taken. Joey is eventually saved by uh, uh, the Pharaoh, a memory of the Pharaoh. And then when Diva says, how the hell did that not work on you? He says, some memories are hard to forget. That's the basic uh, understanding of that. Um, Diva's sister gives Yugi a piece of the puzzle. So there's two missing puzzle pieces, and Kaiba figures this out because he uses machines to build the Millennium Item, which justifies the reason why it said that only Yugi can build it, but then Kaiba says, Yugi was a child when he built this. I'm a man. So I'm gonna build this item. <laughs> and, uh, this, you also get some interactions between Kaiba and the software, uh, android he's made, which the android is like, uh, I know that you like to be flattered, and Kaiba's like, shut up, android. <laughs> <laughs> so there's two missing pieces. Uh, it becomes pretty clear that, so they save everyone. Kaiba's like, okay, I'm gonna, he basically kidnaps Diva, and like, uh, does some sentry deprivation to prevent him to, from using his magic powers, and then he kidnaps him, and then says later on, we're gonna duel for that puzzle piece, cause I'm gonna throw a tournament, cause that's the only thing I know how to do. Uh, Kaiba invites little Yugi to, uh, to the tournament and says, bring that puzzle piece. We're going to duel and this is going to be good. And then <laughs> Yugi goes, Kaiba, what the fuck are you doing? My friend's in danger. And he says, I don't care. 
And so he's invited in true Kaiba fashion. True Kaiba fashion. Also, this is when Mokuba sees Yugi and he says, Hey Yugi, looking good. <laughs> like what you did with the stuff. Okay, so finally they're gonna do a tournament. It's gonna be a three way tournament. Kaiba's like, prepare for the tournament. Uh I'm gonna duel this guy. And uh, this is how it's going to be because I'm fucking Seto Kaiba. And then Yugi goes, fuck you, Kaiba. I need to duel him because he has my friend. And Kaiba says, I don't take demands from you, Yugi. And he says, fucking make me duel him or we're going to have beef. And he says, is that a threat? And Yugi says, I guess it is. And then Kaiba goes, I'm going to allow this to happen. (laughs) Okay, little Yugi duels uh, Diva finally. And it looks like... um, Diva is going to win, and then little Yugi does maybe the shittiest thing ever, which is a uh, fun fan fucking tastic. He traps him in a loop, <laughs> so that he's just gonna lose to him. He uses a trap card that says this monster can't be defeated, and then he uses a trap card that says no. He first uses a trap card that says you take the battle damage from this battle. And then he uses another trap card that says, this monster can't be defeated. And then he uses a third trap card that says, you always have to attack this monster as long as you have a monster on the field. Basically trapping him in a loop, and the guy goes, I can literally can't do anything, you trapped me in a loop. Which is maybe the first time there's ever been a legit Yu-Gi-Oh! game played in all of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s history from the original series. Because this is maybe the one combo I could see happening in real life. The actual We're, card game yeah yeah it is the shittiest combo in the world because it's like nobody expected it at all and it's like the shittiest way to win but is maybe the most accurate to the game so little yugi wins and kaiba is gonna do a little yugi he now has both pieces of the puzzle at this point i forget what happens to him i want to say he just kind of fucks off for a bit he disappears for a bit from the movie. So Kaiba said, right? Yeah, Diva. Diva fucks off from the movie for a bit. Yeah, want- he's like, uh, and he fucking dissolves. Yeah, he's trapped in his little, like, uh, uh, puzzle box that's supposed to be able his to alternative make- of the Shadow Realm. Yes. And so he's stuck in there the for- The Diva Realm. The Diva Realm. He's stuck in the Diva Realm. And Kaiba goes, all right, Yugi, um, I need you to summon the Pharaoh now. And he's like, no, that's not going to happen. And so they duel for a bit, and then it looks like Kaiba is going to win for a bit. It, Kaiba is basically on the up and up, and he says, "I need I, again, I need that Pharaoh." And then Yugi says, "God damn it, Kaiba, I need you to fucking pay attention." So he goes up to the puzzle, which has been standing in like a thing of light. He inserts its lot, the last two puzzle pieces, and then he clicks the button. And if he clicks the button, then all of uh, again Diva's people are going to lose their powers and everything. So they're kind of worried about that. He clicks the button, nothing happens, and Yugi goes. Okay, Kaiba, he's literally gone. He's nowhere to be found. Even if I summon the fucking puzzle, he's not going to come back. So you're just going to have to accept the fact that he's gone. Kaiba does not accept the fact that he is gone, <laughs> and they continue to duel. Uh, little Yugi is about to win. He uses a card, and this is the part where I'm 100% positive that the machine that Kaiba has, it has the ability to cheat for him, because he's about to take 2,500 points of damage. Kaiba has exactly 2,500 points left. He is stuck with 100, and it is never explained how he survived. But I want to say it's 100% the machine listening to the fact that Kaiba says, I can't lose to anyone but the Pharaoh. But, yeah. Unless you remember, do you remember what I'm talking about? It's that one scene. It's literally right before uh, D.Va comes back. Eagly? Uh, So you're talking about when... Like, as they're about to finish the duel, and then Diva comes back out, and he's like, I'm the fucking spirit of the Millennium Ring now? Yes. So, right when he's about, he's literally losing the game. There is no way for him to win. He has exactly enough attack points, but he survives with 100. And it's never explained why he never activates a card or anything. It's just assumed, like, this is, this was, it was literally the end for Kaiba. It just, he didn't lose for some reason. And I want to feel. Yeah, I think it's pretty much just to, so that he can be in the duel next with. Perhaps. And do the tag team shit. Yeah, so anyway, Diva comes back. He's now infused with the ring. He says, Diva's not here anymore, bitch. And he starts taking over the entire world. Because one of the things that they, uh, now are telling us is that if there's any hint of evil inside of. The, uh, the the little cube thing that can make a perfect world, then the world gets corrupt. So the person who's using it has to be basically pure-hearted. And with the ring's influence, he is no longer pure-hearted. So 
Uh, this is one of the few time, one of the many times where I feel like it ends every single Yu-Gi-Oh movie where a tag duel is then made, because I want to say every single Yu-Gi-Oh movie has a tag duel in it. The first one ends with Kaiba and Yugi teaming up a bit uh, uh, against the Pyramid of Light monster. Everyone knows a, a duel across dimension has a literally like three duelists on one, and then this one ends with yeah. a two on one. The triple duel, the legendary triple duel, the legendary triple duel, which three protagonists take on some random ass uh, enemy. <laughs> anyway, so Kaiba shields little Yugi when he's about to lose to his giant fucking monster, and he goes, "Why would you do that, Kaiba? Why'd you save? Why'd you risk your life for me?" And he gives him his item and goes for him. <laughs> and at this point, it looks like uh, Yugi is about to just one hundred percent keel over and die. And then he says the magic words, which are, "I still believe." in the heart of the cards and then like as if that was a summon mechanism the pharaoh comes in is like motherfucker did you just say the magic words yeah he he like it's like a golden fiery spirit of the pharaoh though it's like not actually him no it is not legitimately him but he it has no lines it counts. It's it, it's enough to count because when he and uh, this summon is like if as if little Yugi is going Super Saiyan because he is literally like developed in the golden aura. As, so I'm pretty sure he has the the cape that the Pharaoh wears, like where he turns the jacket into the cape. Yes, he does. He has he he's full on here. He gets summoned, and at this point, the everything becomes silent. There's no words. He doesn't even say, I summon a monster. He summons his friend. <laughs> he doesn't summon the Dark Magician. He summons the friend who is based off the Dark Magician. And then he just fucking obliterates him. Doesn't even explain why he's winning. He just wins. Because he's the fucking Pharaoh. And then it yeah, ends... It, it like doesn't even actually, I think, resolve as a duel. He just gets hit by, like... Yeah. This is uh, this is another one of those moments where I feel like if this movie wasn't so godforsakenly long, this would be a very cool moment of like literally because he gets summoned and it's like literally a force. It's literally building on the fact that you know he's going to win. You don't need to know what he says. He doesn't need to say shit. Nothing needs to be said between this because we already know the outcome the second they summon him. And so they win. They share a little like good eye moment as then he leaves. Everyone's happy. Uh, Joey asks, like, oh, did he ask about me? I bet he's asked about me. And then Yugi goes, like, yeah, he did. He he basically said, I'm glad everyone was looking okay. And then he says to Kaiba, like, uh, no one ever thought he would come back except for you, Kaiba. And then Kaiba goes, I have my own special bond with him, and you have yours. <laughs> so Diva ends up being okay. All the his cult members lose their power, but they seem pretty happy regardless of all that. Everyone, it's pretty happy considering a bunch of active terrorism has happened and a lot of people were harmed at the tournament. All the people who were disappeared to different dimensions return. There's a really good scene, which, uh, unless, I don't know if you caught it, but when people were disappearing and when people come back, a guy who, uh, disappeared and come back comes back with popcorn. So when he disappeared, catch that. so when he, when he was disintegrated, he left with the popcorn and then he came back with the popcorn. That is fantastic. I did not notice that at all. No, it, I noticed it, and I literally had to pause it and then <laughs> re go back there because it was so fucking funny. <laughs> it's tiny things, so everyone's happy now. Uh, uh, Yugi gives his final speech at high school. Everyone cries, including Joey, who ignored it because he was sleeping through it the first time when he had a weird wet uh, one of his many wet dreams of Kaiba. Um, Taya goes I to a weird. They're yeah. still doing that. Still doing that. Uh, he's never going to stop. Taya goes to America, and it's, like, Yuki seems pretty fine with it. I guess it's fine. There was never any real, I guess, I guess he's come to terms with the fact that she didn't like him. She just liked the Pharaoh. He doesn't need that girl in his life. He has plenty of other girls <laughs> to pick from. Mainly, I, I think. One eventually. I assume Rebecca's waiting for him. Just He's just oh, waiting. Right. right. He, he's just waiting for her to get much older. <laughs> Small child. Yeah, small child. And then um, uh, Diva is back at home in Egypt, and he's having fun with his family. And then they cut to Kaiba as he enters a device, 
Kaiba has stolen the little uh square thing that was able to go into different dimensions, and he goes into a, a prototype of something that he calls the dimension prototype. He, Mokuba says, are you sure you want to do this, big brother? And then he says, you're in charge, Mokuba. And then he goes inside and gets blasted into what looks like the middle of the earth, and he literally goes into the afterlife. He enters the, the, pharaoh, the pharaoh's afterlife of Egypt, where he's spending all his free time with his friends. He goes up to his throne room, doesn't say anything, and the pharaoh immediately gets up and the movie ends with what looks like a very sly smile coming to the pharaoh's face. But it doesn't look like he's 100% happy to see the fact that Kaiba is there. Just kind of like... Wouldn't be happy to see Kaiba. No, I wouldn't be happy either. So the movie ends, and that is how the movie ends. That is basically the movie in a nutshell. Oh boy! Also, Bakura got saved as well, but that was before anything else. Uh, anything else happened? But yeah, that's me trying. This movie is two hours fucking long. That's really long. That is insanely long. The movies I like that are two hours long aren't aren't two hours long or so. Like movies I actually enjoy watching aren't this long. Other I, anime. I won't say it was good. <laughs> so here's the thing that i was watching it uh so just to give a preface so i let you know you have not heard my actual opinions of it i actually do like this movie a bunch but i like it for uh, i kind of understand the fact that it's a huge mess and it's way too long but it's going for it's 100 percent a nostalgia movie there's like no way around it there this movie is only here for one reason and it's to show how these characters are doing and that's basically it Sort of, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, with it in a lot of places, like why there was still evil in the Millennium Ring. Yeah. And the puzzle, all you had to do was just dig it up, <laughs> and that was it. Uh, why Kaiba pulled the obelisk out of the ground. Why nobody was like, hey, Kaiba, you can't use that fucking thing you're using that you said makes your deck out of your imagination because that means you can just do whatever you want. Mm. It's so uh, really, I think my biggest issue ignoring all the little nitpicks is that it feels like shit is just like randomly shit's happening for just yeah. reasons. I feel like this would be better if it was like its own tiny season. I think it would give more stuff to breathe. Because, like, again, they introduce the villain and it's not enough time to, like, get used to him or, like, like him or anything. Uh, you get intro – like, there's a lot of plot threads that feel like they're dangling and it feels like it's unresolved simply because they only have – like, even with two hours, it is not enough time to build up all the things that they're going for effectively. If they wanted the movie to be better, they would. I would have completely dropped all the diva stuff and just focused on Kaiba's weird obsession with the pharaoh. Because it is the best – it is the best part of the movie. Well, it's one hundred percent the best part of the movie. But like, you have all that weird shit with with Diva, and the movie's two hours long, but you still come out of it feeling just like exhausted. Yes, like the the, the shit sh going on that it's hard to care about anything. Yeah, it can. Be. Again, the one thing that I feel actually does really get me is the when the Pharaoh shows up, and it's only because they've done a good job of like. He literally doesn't show – the only time he shows up is when it's like – it feels like, oh, it's a memory. So even when Joey gets saved by him, it's still kind of implied it might be the fact that Joey just – the bond between them is too strong. So it's not the fact that the Pharaoh is actually helping him. It's just that the Pharaoh's memory is something that he can't forget no matter how hard. Like it's the one ace in the hole he has against this specific form of torture that he's being put against. But other than that, yeah. With the Pharaoh is that – I really liked about, like, one of these grudges, you gotta stop with this shit, the pharaoh's gone. Mm. The pharaoh's never coming back, and it's over. And Kaiba, because they're both obsessed with this thing that's already passed, right? Mm -hmm. King shows up! Yeah, then he shows up. Then he shows up! And the whole point of the movie up to that point was, like, you guys have to accept that he's gone. You know he's in our he's in our hearts he's in our memory but he he is gone. And then he totally just shows up and ends everything by waving his hand. It, yeah, again, I'm not even like that's not even like a TV trope thing. He literally waves his hand and the movie ends. 
Yeah, it is. When he shows up, it is his way of saying this conflict is over. It is, he may as well have just summoned Exodia because that is what he summoned. Like he didn't even. I don't even think it counted as like a duel because he didn't play anything by the rules. He just like puts a he has a duel disc and he puts a card on it and it's the Dark Magician, but it's like his friend one. It's mm-hmm. the one from Millennium World. Yeah, he didn't actually follow any rules to play that card, so he just wins. And yeah. the bad guy fucking dies. And then Yugi's like, oh, it's the Pharaoh. Hi, buddy. Yeah, it is. Uh... That? You just fucking told me that I couldn't ever see him again. And he was right there. And it it really frames the, the movie as this to like, I guess Kaiba was right all along. Like, because again, Kaiba's doing a lot of questionable things, but I always feel the uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! in particular has always been like, Kaiba's misguided in his whatever he's doing. This is the first time where Kaiba is 100% right. There's like no, there's no justifying the fact that if Kaiba did not do any of the things he did, uh, then the world would not be saved. (laughs) Because, yeah, everyone who, Bakura would still be fucked over, so would be Joey. But because he literally summoned the Pharaoh through what feels like pure force of will, the day is saved. And it feels weird to be like, I guess, like, Yugi was wrong? Yeah, y- Yugi was, like, wrong with the right message? Yes. Because Yugi was saying the right things. He was. He actually shows up, he just looks like an asshole. Yeah, and I guess he's like... and. I guess they do, at least he never speaks to him. He never gives him, like, a doll oh, Yugi, you being your love here. He was more like, it was literally like a passing mention. It was as if he summoned a ghost, and then the ghost yeah, was done. They actually speak, right? Don't they just kind of, like, no. look at each other? They don't. He it, It's it, it's more like, I feel like that's the why he says, like, with Joey, when they look at each other, like, the bond between them is so strong that they don't need to say words to each other, and we don't need to hear I, what they're saying. Understood, like, yeah, small interaction. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of the stuff the movie does right could be better if the movie was just framed differently. <laughs> yeah, because there's not like there's nothing good there. No. Again, some the, the duels are now at 8,000 life points and there's way too many duels like Kaiba versus the Yugi. There's way too many duels and the movie doesn't give a shit about them because the movie constantly has characters that are just like, fuck this, I'm just going to cheat. Yeah. And then we're going to stop playing. Again, the most legit duel is between Yugi and Diva, and I think that's the one that's given the most room to breathe, and it has, like, a legit outcome. Like, there's some weird stuff about the fact, like, okay, Diva keeps attacking, but I think they're just trying to say, like, we don't have to say your turn. But if we follow it, like, the weird way it goes, like, it feels like, okay, so whose turn is ending? Because that's when the part where it's, like, they're playing Yu-Gi-Oh, but they're not playing Yu-Gi-Oh the way I want them to play Yu-Gi-Oh. Right. Like, they're not actually playing and I mean, part of it is just that it's a movie, and they don't have time. That there's so many duels in this movie. Yeah, they, they assume Kaiba versus Yami in the beginning. You've got Kaiba versus Diva versus Diva. Then you have Yugi versus Kaiba. Then you have the little tag thing: Yugi, Kaiba, and Diva. And only one of those duels actually has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yep. Only there's only one legit duel, and that is Yugi versus Diva. Every other mm-hmm. duel if it ends... The only duel that starts, they play the game. Yeah. The other one is technically, I guess, the Pharaoh versus Kaiba, but that's a weird simulation where it's literally built around the fact that Kaiba can't lose this one. Yeah, and it, if I remember correctly, it, that duel doesn't, like... Last long, no. It, well, one, it doesn't last long, and two, it doesn't, like, actively begin anything. Like, they just cut to Kaiba, and he's fucking dueling the Pharaoh. Like he the the Pharaoh walks into a church, which he looks like he's entering the church from Undertale, where Sans tells yeah, it's the like t- a straight up actual like holy place. Yeah, and then he duels Kaiba, and then they duel for a bit, and then it's revealed to be a simulation, which is what Kaiba imagined what their duel would be, which then implies that Kaiba thinks that he's holy, so he has to go to a holy world in order to fight to fight each other, or maybe that's is what is that what he thinks that like oh he's in the afterlife, so I have to do yeah. this. So he's like, obviously, this is what he believes the afterlife to be. And then when he goes to fair, uh, the, the one thing I'm thinking about is that when he finds his actual afterlife, he's just thinking like, okay, so for the next simulation, Egypt, big throne room, bunch of guards, he's brown now. 
I'm gonna have to accept the fact that this Yugi is brown, and then I'm also gonna have to fact that he does not wearing any shirt. He's not doing any of that. That's why he doesn't say anything because he's too busy thinking about like how do I improve my Yugi simulation. <laughs> well, what the fuck is even the, the shit that Kaiba fucking does later? Like he's on a elevator in space. I don't towards the Earth. So and then he's in Egypt afterlife. Yeah. So here's my reasoning behind the fact that I think 5Ds makes perfect sense now. Uh, Kaiba fucked up the world. I think this. Do you think that's when Kaiba fucks the future? Yes. I think that this movie is the perfect reason why 5Ds exist. Because I feel like there's a certain, and this is another thing of like, I really wish they had focused on this story. The fact that Kaiba has basically personally shaped the world around the image he wants. At one point, he literally says, um, I hope you're, if, I don't know who created this world, but if it worked for Kaiba Corp, he would be fired. Kaiba is saying that to God himself, the creator of the world, you did a fucking bad job and you would not cut it at my world. And so I will literally shape the world in the image I want by introducing a dual disc that really should be investigated over the fact that whoever wears it, their, their whatever they think the world is possible is going to happen. And also the fact that it's going to be so expensive Jo- uh, duelists like Joey aren't going to be able to afford it. Like du- uh, Joey is literally having nightmares over the fact, like, oh, I'm not going to be able to afford this. Like, all I have is like the shitty regular cheap dual disc that keeps breaking. So Kaiba is literally introducing already a new class of people, which is the ones who can afford the world arc altering dual disc, and those who are forced to live in the past with the basic dual disc. It's also weird, like. uh Close to fucking movie's concept of the afterlife, right? Yeah. Because he ends up, is everyone's afterlife just like what they were living in before? Afterlife, he's just sitting on a throne in Egypt. So I assume that this was, um, this one's weird because I feel like the specifically the Pharaoh's afterlife is built over, especially because ancient Egyptian, um, uh, like kind of their version of the afterlife, your servants go with you. So his afterlife has all the servants that he had in real world. So that's kind of why his afterlife is so weird is that it's based off the Egyptian one over the fact that like, that's, that that's how the afterlife works is that he is specifically in Egypt's afterlife. Yeah. That means that whatever fucking thing Kaiba made, he could he could go to any afterlife if he wanted. Yeah, he could duel anyone <laughs> that he wanted. If he wanted to he go back to Jesus if he wanted to. Pick up the dual disc, oh Jesus, of Nazareth. <laughs> Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, uh, dual Monsters Ball Run. Dual Monsters Ball Yeah, 100%. I have to collect the bones of Jesus so I can find so I can finally so duel. I can duel him. You don't compare to the Pharaoh. And this one, he duels Buddha, who tries to teach him the fact that he doesn't need money to be happy. He's like, keep your hippie <laughs> jargon to yourself, old fat man. <laughs> I would 100%, by the way, want a movie where Kaiba just goes to alternate dimension and fights, like, uh, big uh, histor- historical figures. So he fights Joan really of Arc. Historical people? <laughs> yeah, he fights Joan of Arc, who's like, I hear uh, voices from God, and they tell me what cards to play, and he's like, I used to know a person like that. You don't compare to him. <laughs> <laughs> so he just duels everyone throughout, like, history, and every single person, he's like, you're no pharaoh. Yeah, exactly. He's just trying to find the next rival. He's like, first of all, obviously the pharaoh is some on some next level shit. Uh, I need to get my game up, so I'm gonna have to duel all these other people. He's gonna have to, at one point he runs into the three musketeers, he's like, I'll take all three of you on at once. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I also don't really understand what this game means, uh, what this game, what this movie means for, like, Yu-Gi-Oh! lore as a whole. Uh, because in GX... Yeah, I th- I kind of want to see it like a cutaway to Jaden at one point as he's like also trying to come up and coming and he goes like, wow, uh, okay, I guess. Yeah, and like just what in general, because I mean, the Yu-Gi-Oh! movie before this was Bonds Beyond Time, mm-hmm. which solidifies that yes, all of these 
all of these series take place in the same universe. Yeah, so... 100% Jaden and Yusei exist. Yes. Then this movie takes place after Bonds Beyond Time, but has some weird, like... And this shit doesn't make any fucking sense. Differences. No. That, as did, far as GX goes. Unless Kaiba went to the afterlife, dueled, and then came back. Yeah, that's the one thing, is that I'm pretty sure at some point, either Kaiba comes back, or Mokuba is hiding the fact that Kaiba is not back. It, you, the, you physically see Kaiba in GX. He's there. But is that Kaiba? This is li- this Did is he, Mokuba get like a fake Kaiba stand. Yes, is that a Kaiba machine? And this entire time, he's been hiding the fact that Kaiba literally flew the coop to go fight a pharaoh in the afterlife. Because nobody, you know, what would the stockholders say? Excuse me, the genius boy who's basically reshaping the world so our economy runs around duelists. Where is he? Um. He, true, the big five would try to take over the company. Again. They would, yeah, are you kidding me? That would be such a hostile takeover. The only reason there's not a hostile takeover is the fact that I think every businessman in the world is afraid of Kaiba. That's a good point. Most of them are. Yeah, I would be terrified of Kaiba too. Are you kidding me? This man is literally like the 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 device he created is insane. Because at one point the uh, diva tries to disintegrate um, Kaiba and send him to an alt- another dimension. And Kaiba puts on the dual disc and goes, wrong, bitch. Science has no limitations when it's made by Seto Kaiba. Uh, and diva's using like borderline shadow power. He's using power that can recreate the entire world and it's not affecting Kaiba. You have to re- like he's like so freaked out because he's like, wait, what the fuck is this guy doing? This doesn't make any sense. And really, I think again, this movie would be a hundred percent better if it was more focused on Kaiba because what Kaiba's going through is literally what happens when you're what happens when the rival that you've literally that drives you to be better is no longer there, and it's like, well. He has little Yugi, but it's not the same to him. That's not the person who beat him. That's not the person who scarred him. He literally talks about, like, how do you, uh, get, how do you, like, heal from scars that won't heal? It's that you literally uh, put a defeat so hard on your opponent, it rocks their soul. He's not after, (laughs) like, he doesn't just want to beat Yugi. He wants to destroy his soul. Yeah, he wants to he wants to dominate Yugi and it's really interesting because I feel like uh very few animes or manga or anything deal with the fact of like when a good rivalry is built up and I regardless of what you think of Yu-Gi-Oh, I think the rivalry between Kaiba and Yugi is a good one because Kaiba's literally like I don't think how many times Kaiba's beaten got beaten down by Yugi and he literally just comes back way stronger than expected. Like Kaiba's just such a such a pain in the ass to ever want to fight he's the most annoying of rivals yeah yeah i would say so yeah um in this movie especially he might be the only character that i think is well done Mm -hmm. little yugi because little yugi's only character trait is like he's not the pharaoh boy yeah like his only character trait is that he likes his friends and he's pretty good at card games I think there's some – there's small hints of what uh, what actual Bakura is because, again, I feel like there is something to say to the fact that, like, he was possessed. He has the exact opposite of the relationship between uh, the Pharaoh and Yugi because his relationship was an abusive one. So he realizes right, the f- – yeah. Thief King Bakura – it was a parasite basically yeah feeding off of him and literally ruining his life and every given turn he doesn't have a father because of him he tried to kill his friends on multiple occasions and also take over the world so when he gets confronted with the fact of like remember the horrible night where literally your entire life changed like that you're the reason behind anything everything you're the catalyst behind everything and he does something that's very uh weird and for someone in that situation he doesn't try and say like he does say at one point is like the ring was the one behind it, but then he doesn't go 
he doesn't say like i i didn't have anything to do behind it all he does is say i'm sorry like that was still technically me that did it i just was under possession but i really didn't if it was up to me that night would never happen as well and he kind of shows like some form of ptsd over the fact that like yeah no that that night was horrible and i actually feel your pain because you're not the only one who lost everything he lost his father he lost his innocence he lost everything and he cries to him and he's like and that i feel like that's enough to go to make the villain go like diva specifically go like oh i feel like (laughs) am i the baddie in this situation (laughs) am i the bad guy am i the bad this oh i i like, there's something, like, inherent to the fact that, like, literally all Bakura is is a very good boy that is unfortunately possessed by a bad one. Yeah, pretty much. So Bakura when good... is a very nice person in very bad circumstances. Yeah, and he kind of, when you when he shows the pain that he's been felt under, and he actually talks about it. Because, again, he really can't talk to this to anyone. Like, even to someone like Yugi who went through something similar, it's not the same thing. So he also eventually, I feel like they also could have leaned more a little bit on the fact that the Millennium Ring is back, that Bakura, like, I think after the Millennium Ring gets activated, there's some hints of, like, him going, like, weird, he just feels weird, but that's another thing of, like, I would have liked another exploration of that, of, like, the fact that uh, Bakura's, like, evil spirit dad is basically back. But I feel it shouldn't be. That's the thing that that bothers me a little bit about the Millennium Ring. Is that it's back. The spirit should be dead. Yeah, again, because Aten kills it. Yes, it's back, and the ring is still evil. Yeah, there, there's a lot of things of like the um, if it was going to come back the way it did, which I feel like the only reason it came back is because more than anything, if there's a second villain that is reoccurring, it is the ring. Because Kaipa is the another reoccurring villain, but he's the he's now basically been relegated to rival, and he's not. He does more or less an anti-hero at this point. Yeah, he doesn't kill 100 percent of the time when he does kill it's uh kind of in the situation of like you're just getting in my way and also he tries to avoid killing if he can uh before, really by battle city kaiba's more or less a good a good ish guy yeah he's he's an asshole but he's not a murdering asshole bakura was uh, evil bakura was just that he was an evil murdering bastard <laughs> there was like no good in him oh not at all so yeah, I he feel was like literally the priest of darkness. Exactly. So I feel like they could have leaned into a little bit more. I liked that moment with him, but people like Joey, like Tristan, at one point disappears from the film, and they make a comment of like, "Oh, we're hanging out with this new guy," and then as they're going away, they're like, "We should get Tristan." And I was like, "Why isn't Tristan there? <laughs> Why isn't he there?" That's a very good question. Like, it's not just Joey and Taya hanging around. He just kind of gets uh, relegated to the side. Taya's only moment is the fact that she eventually goes to America, but that's really it. Like you never, you never get a sense of like how she's been dealing with the fact that the Pharaoh's gone. And I feel like she was pretty bummed out by the. F- she wanted little Yugi to lose by the end, right? She wasn't outright rooting for it, but she wasn't on his side. I, I, Again, it's it, in that she's. Well, I think that she wasn't really rooting for either one. So after uh, Little Yugi wins, that yeah. asks the Pharaoh to stay anyway. Yeah. So again, there's there's a lot of character moments that just feel like they could have had and they decided not to have it. For whatever reason. And I feel like it's because this would have been better as a anime series. A small mini anime series of maybe like, maybe, I don't know six the problem is is that once you get into the anime the way that Yu-Gi-Oh tr- structures its duels is very different and i feel like that's why like the it has such a weird pace to it is that in the show they can dedicate i guess what what is it like some what, six episodes to a single duel when it's important and when you have this many important duels they can't do that anymore so it's like well we have two hours at best and this movie's ending I almost feel like this movie was sort of hamstrung by its want to have a villain. Yes. Yeah, I I can feel that. Or maybe the want to not 100% make Kaiba the villain. Like, I feel like a lot of the times, and this happens in Pyramid of Light as well, the main catalyst is Kaiba, but then he's not the actual villain. He's just like a, 
what is in essence a pawn of some corns. At this in this movie, at least he's not a pawn. But yeah, for whatever reason, they feel like they need a villain, and it's like no, the villain could literally just be the fact that like a person is gone. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a movie that seems like it wants to explore how these characters are living in a world without the Pharaoh, mm-hmm. but it won't commit to that because it's also dealing with all this diva bullshit. Yeah, which again, the movie I feel would be better. You wouldn't get the Bakura, but you could still have like a more silent scene between Bakura and Yugi as they talk about like, you know, their experiences together. Like you could still have that scene. You just need to reframe it differently. And uh, for what this movie is, it's... Again, two hours of Yu-Gi-Oh! So if you're into Yu-Gi-Oh!, I feel like this is also maybe one of the better animated of the movies. Well, yeah, the animation's beautiful. The art yeah. style's very good. It's modernized, but it doesn't feel like generic. Yeah, and a lot of the cool, a lot of the end moments are fantastic. And uh, there's a lot of cool stuff around it for sure. It's just like. I feel like the the one half of it is like this is all cool and this is the cool parts that I like about Yu-Gi-Oh! And then the other half is I just wish this was better because I feel like – especially in an age where um, anime uh, from the specific 90s are coming back in specific ways. Like yu gi Oh show, for example, was able to come back and Yu-Gi-Oh! – definitely had a chance of coming back and telling this story because again there's plenty of time between this and gx gx is maybe the part where you go like okay by this point yugi has to be this age and he has to look kind of like the pharaoh right now where he's at he's not exactly at that point but i guess they yeah. feel it, mm-hmm. like right in the middle there um where yugi hasn't really grown into what he becomes in gx and you know in GX, Yugi, Joey, and Kaiba are like legendary duelists of legend. Yeah, yeah, they're a big deal. They're like world famous people yeah. because the Yu Gi Oh world runs entirely off of card games. Yeah. Um. Really, just with this movie, it just seems like had they made the movie, it was just that Kaiba wants the Pharaoh back. Up that he's digging up what is essentially his grave. Mm-hmm. Yugi to make the puzzle again and that he and Yugi duel and the outcome of that duel is that Kaiba loses Pharaoh's fucking gone dude and you have to deal with it that would have been fine yeah horned in like a fucking shadow realm Egypt is still bad bullshit in there and that just like what what did diva bring to this movie as a character at all he made me really confused about what uh shoddy was doing because i feel like i understood the fact that shoddy was an enigma i did not need to know the fact that shoddy was actually a very weird cult dude and that he he did save these orphans but also he died and also he was still the leader of the ankh and even though he was like a spirit ghost he never stopped to like go to his orphans and go Hey, it's okay. That's the way destiny rolls. Stick to the plan. Don't avenge me. <laughs> Don't avenge anyone. Because, yeah, it, and you know, you were talking earlier about oh, why was Tristan? Why was he not there yet? And that Taya didn't do anything. And I feel like if you sat the movie down, conflict of the movie, Yugi versus Kaiba. Neither one is inherently wrong necessarily. Mm-hmm of not being very cool about it yugi's friend group and kaiba the loss of the pharaoh affected each of them you would have time to see Taya and see like how she's america and the conflict about it and you know maybe if the pharaoh hadn't gone maybe she wouldn't have left mm-hmm and any of that kind of stuff, like, Yugi is not the only character that's relevant to the Pharaoh. Like, even Joey he gets basically kicked out of this movie. Yeah. And I feel like uh, it's another case of, like, Joey does not duel. Joey doesn't have any new cards. Again, when when Yugi shows off his Dark Magician, it is a new Dark Magician. When Kaiba summons a Blue Eyes, it's the new Blue Eyes. When he shows Diva his Red Eyes and it's the same janky-ass old Red Eyes, I was like, did did Joey not change his deck with the changing of the meta? Like now I'm interested in like, so Joey is poor. 
and he's playing a game that literally requires you to constantly spend money on it. He can't afford to get a new dual disc. So I feel like if you wanted to have another, like, um, if you could replace a lot of the diva stuff and then you would have Joey, like, if you wanted to still have some duels, you could have Joey trying to, like, he's like, all right, I summon Swordsman of Landstar. And then the other guy's like, I sum- I synchro summon 27 different monsters on the same turn. Yeah. I mean, even if you just had, like, you have that initial duel with Kaiba and his fake Pharaoh. Mm-hmm duel later on that's Kaiba and Joey and Yugi and then you're done. Bam. Effective, relevant duels that matter to us. Yes. And the Kaiba versus Joey thing could totally be a setup of like literally like Kaiba's like uh, why are you still a duelist? You literally can't afford to keep up. You do you, you couldn't afford to keep up with me back then and now look at you now. <laughs> I've created right. Look at what I've made. Look at how much money I have. And then, excuse me, what version of the Red Eyes do you have? You still using Time Wizard? You still using Baby Dragon? That's like 27 packs ago. And I feel like that's the kind of stuff, like, I feel like that's what I personally would have wanted more. And that's what makes this movie, like, so hard to, like, wrap my head around of, like, this isn't 100% what I wanted. I did like seeing them, but I also can't help the fact that I would have liked to see him in something better. Yeah, because you mentioned it was like a pure nostalgia movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, not a lot of the possible nostalgia moments to set up this stupid, weak villain that no one cares about. Yeah, that's the part where it kind of loses it. The, the nostalgia points that always hit me is, again, seeing the Pharaoh return. Because when he does return, uh, it is he is enwrapped in like a golden thing of light and yeah it doesn't make sense that he comes back and that's the part where it goes like that's where i'm like that's where i allow my specific nostalgia to go away of like yeah but he's back for a brief moment and it's really cool and he's like he doesn't get to say his line at one point kaiba steals his line (laughs) which is really funny when he's dueling yugi when he's like what would the pharaoh say the game is about to end or something like he literally steals his catchphrase and he uses it on yugi (laughs) Yeah, I do remember that. It's great. And really, if anything, this movie, you should watch it for all the Kaiba parts. Because every single scene Kaiba is in, it's similar to like how Joker makes the Dark Knight. And when he's not on screen, the Dark Knight gets much worse. When Kaiba's not on screen, it makes it much worse. Uh, yeah, basically. Yeah. He is 100% the good part of this movie. The, like the, just the struggle between the two characters like the conflict that's going on there yeah it's the only good part of the movie and the rest of it is fucking terrible yeah yeah 100 percent. and um again a lot of the things about shoddy just feels like it's dead like they, ignore the fact that the dueling is weird because now i'm pretty sure that how can they be using cars that i think would exist in zexel before zexel happens but to be fair to them they never outright say that's the kind of summoning they're doing their cards just look like slightly different yes so i feel that's how they get away with it is that like our cards look different and you know what these cards are but um we're not really going to talk about it very much also at one point i think they even still tribute summon a couple times yeah they do um when um dimension duelist doesn't require uh tribute summoning there's also, again, there's a lot of little, little fun cameos. I think that my favorite cameo is from, uh, Soggy the Dark Clown, which is, which appears in the, in the Pharaoh versus Kaiba, which, uh, uh, Yugi is about to use Thousand Knives to kill, uh, his blue eyes, and then he sacrifices his Soggy the Dark Clown. And that point, I was like, Kaiba, why are you using Soggy the Dark Clown? Why? Uh- I think it's for Crush Card Virus. I think the Crush Card thing is like he has his own form of the Griggle Gambit, which is called the so- the Soggy the Soggy Gambit or something, where he uses Soggy as like, oh, I'm going to attack Soggy, and then he uses card uh, Deck Destruction Virus or something, and he completely destroys their deck. Like, that's the only justification in my mind as to why he's still using Soggy the Dark Clown. I could see that. You know, I actually don't hate that. Um, but... But I don't know. I feel like I've said everything I can say about this movie. Yeah. It it was a movie built on an interesting premise, owned by its need to be a generic battle shown in anime movie. Yeah, when it could we could have been so much more. It could have been something truly amazing. 
really, really likes Yu-Gi-Oh! Um, especially Duel Monsters and GX. Mm-hmm. It sucked to see all of the stuff that could have happened that would have completely like meant a lot to me as a fan and get they could fight some sort of remnant of Egypt's wrath. Yeah. And if, if, and if you want a specific anime movie that I feel like kind of does not a hundred percent, the things we want, but I think is the good nostalgic movie that is nostalgic, but also just a good movie. It's battle of gods. Battle of mm-hmm. gods yeah. is able to balance like the fact of like, here's a new villain. It's Beerus. He has this, but also you get like all the cool things. Like you get boof, like the entire fact that Beerus is angry for pudding and that the villain actually interacts with Majin Buu's weird ass request. <laughs> Of like, I only I eat the pudding, and then Beerus goes like, "How fucking dare you!" Like that's the kind of thing. Like if only the villain was a little. That's what happens when your villain is actually fitted well into your universe, as opposed to like some generic Egyptian man. Right, and like you know, you have not in anything before Battle of the Gods, completely brand new for that. But he fit in fine with the cast, and he did things around the cast. Mm-hmm. Diva yeah. bullshit. Shit is like completely disconnected from Yugi, other than when he's pretending to be Yugi's buddy. Yeah. So. So when you have Beerus, Re, I'm the god of destruction. Everyone gets to chime in, and part of it is that Yu-Gi-Oh is inherently a one-on-one. All the movies make it two-on-one or whatever. Mm-hmm. So it. It's not like you can have every character chip again. Like they all can't bum rush Diva, and only Yugi is left standing. You know, yeah. it's frustrating when there's all this shit going on, and the whole time I'm like, so what's what's Kaiba doing? Yeah, well, yeah, that's and it's the rub. So yeah, that's Yu Gi Oh, the dark side of dimensions. If you're a fan dark of Yu Gi Oh, dimensions, yeah, check it out. If you're a fan of Yu-Gi-Oh, and even if you're not, if you like Kaiba a bunch, if you don't like Kaiba, then I think you also don't like Yu-Gi-Oh. I think that's actually impossible. Yeah, yeah it's very, I, I don't see how you could enjoy Yu-Gi-Oh, but I really not like Kaiba. Yeah. Also, another good moment, which is Kaiba related, is when they play the old Kaiba theme, which is Kaiba's at a computer. Like, they play that theme at one point in the middle of the movie, and I go, hell yeah, Kaiba's back at the computer. Uh, at the computer once again. Yeah, because they play like the... Kaiba has a very specific theme, and when you put it against modern music, it stands out. So for the most part, the theme uh, is not played, but then at one point in the middle of the movie, when Kaiba's thinking, they play it, they go, Burn it, and then it plays, and they go like, hell yeah, the theme is playing. <laughs> Only someone who has watched a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! would go like, it's the theme. It's the song. <laughs> it's the one where he's... <laughs> It's his song, but yeah, that that's the movie. Oh boy, that's a lot of talk for Yu Gi Oh. Yeah, I do like some Yu Gi Oh. Yeah, we do. We I think it's been proven at this point that this channel is fifty uh, percent Yu Gi Oh. Yeah, we're kind of hitting that point. <laughs> the, the, it's worth it. it I love Yu Gi Oh, so it's fine. Yeah, uh, it it was it hasn't been released yet, but the two hundredth episode of this channel is technically a Yu Gi Oh episode, and. Fantastic. Yeah, it's great. It's fa- It's the, yeah, look forward to that one. But, yeah. All right, then. So, yeah, Concession Stand is back for the time being. Again, it it's going to be always based on the fact of how easy can we find the movies until um, I'm in a better situation. So, the next movie that we're going to see, you're a preview of upcoming attractions. I remembered this bit because I, this entire time I was stalling to try and remember what I say next. <laughs> um, it is going to be Sorry for Bothering You, which you can find on Hulu. So if you want to watch along with us, go to Hulu, watch Sorry for Bothering You. Uh, Zen, have you heard of this movie? 100% not heard of this movie. Okay, so let me give the quick uh, small pitch. A man who goes to work for a telemarketing company, and in order to do better, he is a black man, he puts on a white voice. Uh, That's the beginning premise of it, and that's all I'll say. It is by Bootsy Collins, who is a uh, rap man turned into a, a director for this one movie. It is a dark comedy, possibly sci-fi movie. <laughs> So, 
yeah, check out that movie because I watched it and I'm going to have Zen watch it because I need to have someone else to talk about this fucking movie because it is something else. So look forward to that. And look forward to that too for you, Zen. I'm game. All right. So yeah, thanks again for watching another episode of The Concession Stand. We'll, We'll see you next time. Uh, I don't know when the next time will be, but whenever it is, we'll be right there. We'll be one. We're, we're not going to let it die, I hopefully. Never. Again, no series is ever dead. It just takes a long time for it to come out. Star Hunter Hunter. Yeah. <laughs> My back really hurts. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone.